Want to learn how to save $400,000 so your peanut can go to college in 18 years? Me too! Just kidding. Well, only partially. In this video, we're going to talk about the three best savings accounts you can use to save for college. Welcome to Money Med School, where doctors come to learn about money. Let's talk about the best ways to save for college so your peanut can get a good job Sometimes it feels more like how to save one million dollars so your peanut can go to college. Isn't it crazy how much college costs in the United States? Other countries look at us funny when they hear how ridiculous it is. For example, in the UK, paying for college is a relatively recent development and it's usually a few thousand dollars per year, like four figures per year, and even that is considered outrageous. College costs so much money that many students have to take out big student loans, and as a result, kids these days start off their working lives thousands of dollars in debt. Right after your little peanut is born, amongst the hormone-addled sleep deprivation fog, you may be thinking, now's a good time to sell a kidney so that I can get a jump on our college savings plan. <laughs> but before you sell an organ, let's learn a few other ways that you can fund peanuts education. There's two ways to save money. Save the money in an old regular old bank account or invest the money. If you just put the money in a savings account, the money will depreciate because current savings account interest rates are lower than the rate of inflation. In other words, money is losing value faster than a savings account can compensate for it. Which brings me to invest the money. This is the only way to make the money grow and outpace inflation. There are many ways to invest. Stock market, that includes mutual funds, ETFs, and even bonds. Um, real estate, cryptocurrency, and when I say cryptocurrency, I specifically am referring to Bitcoin. Venture capital, peer-to-peer -peer lending, private equity, and private opportunities. But I am going to speak about investing in the stock market today because that's the simplest option and although real estate, crypto, and private opportunities can be great options, I'd like to keep this presentation simple. Also, you must fully understand any investment before you invest into it and that's beyond the scope of this presentation to explain all of those types of investments. If you're interested in learning more, you can visit the resources page on the blog. The link is in the show notes. Just a word about simple interest versus compound interest. When you invest money, there are two ways that money can grow, with simple interest or with compound interest. You want compound. This is how you get the most leverage on your investment. The earlier you start, the less money you need to invest to reach your goals. But compound interest takes time. The real exponential growth doesn't really pick up until about 20 years in. So as you can see, with simple investing, so your principal's down here in the blue, and your growth, your gains, is the gray. With simple investing, or simple interest, you, your growth is linear. So you get the same amount every year. Now with compound, your growth is exponential. It has a curve to it. But as you can see, that curve is pretty similar to a linear elevation until you get around your year 2021, it really starts to increase after that. And that's when you see the real magic of compound investing. Here's the thing, a couple things about saving for college. There are a few special considerations when it comes to this particular savings goal. Number one, the magic of compounding interest kicks in right about the time you're ready to use the money. So unlike a retirement account that has 30 years or more to really soak up the compounding in the tail ends, a kid's college savings account has only been around for max 18 years, so it's not going to see those exponential returns in the tail. Number two, 
college is going to cost an absolute shit ton of money in 18 years. The rate of college tuition has increased more than double the rate of inflation. It could cost over six figures a year to send a kid to college in the future. It currently costs $80,000 at some schools. And number three, always make sure you pay yourself first. You have got to cover your retirement savings before you start covering college tuition. I don't mean sequentially, I mean what you allot for monthly. You have to make sure that you're allotting enough for your retirement and you have, you're using funds that are left over to save for college. Let's take a closer look. On the left, you can see that the average cost of college of a one year of college has risen from fifteen to thirty five thousand dollars per year at private schools and three point two thousand to ten thousand per year at public schools from the years nineteen eighty seven to the years twenty eighteen. The graph on the right shows the rate of inflation in pale green down here. So this is the rate of inflation versus the rate of college tuition increases, which is this curve here from 1980 to 2020. Average college tuition and fees have increased by 1,200% since 1980 versus inflation, which has gone up 236%. This is why your parents could put themselves through college with a summer job and you'll have to take out a mortgage worth of student loans to get through. Okie dokie. On that happy note, how do we get saving? There are three kinds of accounts uh, that you can use for investing for college. Number one, a 529 plan. Number two, a UGMA or UTMA account. And number three, a custodial IRA. Let's start with a 529 plan. We'll talk about the rules of 529s, the two different kinds of 529s, how your money is invested when you open a 529 account, and how to find the best 529 for you. We'll also review the risks and benefits of 529s, because you know I'm not letting you leave here without an informed consent. Here's a fascinating fact. The 529 is named for the tax law that created it. You guessed it, Section 529 of the U.S. Federal Tax Code. The 529 is a tax-advantaged account, and this means that all the money that your investment earns, i.e. the gains, are never taxed. Unless, here's the caveat, unless the funds are not used according to the rules. These are the rules of a 529 account. You can use it to pay for qualified expenses, which are K-12 through education, apprenticeship programs, college tuition, fees, room and board, and related educational costs. And you can pay for up to $10,000 of student loan repayment, which really makes me scratch my head. Here we are using a savings plan for college that you are saving to help you avoid debt, which you can then use to pay debt. Okay. There is no cap on annual contributions, however, some states cap total contributions between $235,000 to $525,000. If you use the money for a non-qualified expense, then you'll have to pay taxes on those gains plus a 10% penalty. One thing to note, even though you can use 529 money for any grade, any grade of school, it doesn't make sense to use it until college because you'll have trouble seeing much growth if you're constantly chipping away at the principal. There are two kinds of 529 accounts, savings plan and prepaid tuition plan. So the savings plan is your usual Typical account, you open the account, you invest money in it, the money grows over time, you withdraw it when it's time to pay for college. Prepaid tuition plan, this one's a bit more of a gamble. You invest the money, but you say, okay, this money is specifically for tuition at our in-state school. The benefit of this is that you lock in today's tuition rate. The risk is that your kid grows up and is like, fuck that state school, I want to follow my dreams of becoming a professional batik artist, and I want to go to XYZ Fantasy Unicorn Art School for $400,000 per year. This prepaid option is offered by 11 states 
for in-state tuition only. Who offers 529 accounts? These are state-sponsored plans, which means they are offered by every state except for Wyoming and the District of Columbia, which really is in a state anyway. <laughs> so, for example, you'll see the New York plan or the Utah plan. To make it even less straightforward, you don't have to use the plan of the state you live in. Anyone can use any state's plan, although some states give you a tax benefit for using the plan of the state you live in. Now, to clarify, you can go to Fidelity or Vanguard or any other investment firm and sign up for a 529, but it will be a particular state's 529 that is managed by Fidelity or Vanguard or any firm that you pick. What I mean is, for example, if you go to Vanguard.com and you look at their 529 plan, it's actually Nevada's plan. It's called the Vanguard 529 College Savings Plan, and it is a Nevada trust administered by the office of the state of the uh, the state of Nevada treasurer. So that's what the official designation is. If you go to Fidelity, for example, you'll see that they manage the New Hampshire fund, Arizona, Connecticut, Delaware, and Massachusetts plans. So how do you choose a plan? First, you got to figure out: Does your state give you a tax benefit for using? your state's plan. If not, or if the benefit is very small, then go ahead and check out the websites that list the best 529 plans. Every year there are websites that rank the plans based on fees, investment performance, and other helpful criteria. And I've included a list of links to these uh, websites in the show notes below. In general, recently Ohio, Utah, Virginia, Illinois, and New York uh, and also sometimes Massachusetts consistently rank highly across all the lists. There's another link at savingforcollege.com that you can open up and it will give you a list of all the plans and buttons to enroll in each one of those plans. So you can, once you've decided which one you want, you just go to that page and click on the button that you want. So how does a 529 plan work? The money that you invest in a 529 is invested into the stock market. These investments are selected and managed by whatever firm or manager the state's 529 plan hires to manage the fund. There will be fees for this management service, but they're relatively low. It could be that the money is invested into mutual funds or a particular set of funds that are designated by the plan manager. Often they go into a targeted age-based fund which means that the investments become less aggressive over time to reduce the risk of losing money right before you need to withdraw it. And that helps to mitigate the risk of um, losing money in the stock market. So as you get closer to withdrawal time, you're going to be moved out of stocks and more into bonds. The 529 options for investments are similar to when you invest in your company's 401k. They offer you a limited selection of investment products to choose from, or sometimes they just do it for you. You may be thinking, well, I'm not just invest on my own. You could do that and probably keep fees down, and maybe you could even make more returns. But you wouldn't have the tax-free growth or the state income tax advantage if applicable. So that's why. Because even if your investments in the 529 don't perform as well as ones that you might have chosen, the tax advantages that you'll get will more than even out that advantage your investments might have had. Which brings me to the benefits of a 529. So again, this is a tax-advantaged account. Gains are not taxed. Gotta follow the rules, though. Your state may offer you a tax benefit as well. And um, the parent, if this is an account owned you know, in the parent's name or in the kid's name, then it's not going to ding you when it comes to your FAFSA application. So less than 6% of the total account value will count towards figuring out your family contribution to financial aid. Now, be careful because if the 529 is owned by a grandparent or another relative or some other third party, this can reduce the student's financial aid eligibility because it might be counted differently. You only get that 6% uh, option when it's owned by the parent or the kid. 
Another great benefit to the 529 is that the beneficiary can be changed. So you can switch it to another kid, you can switch it to another relative, or even you can become the beneficiary. Well, what are the risks? So the biggest risk of a 529 is Peanut decides Peanut doesn't want to go to college. And if the money isn't spent on education-related expenses, you're going to have to pay taxes on the gains plus a 10% penalty. And I'm going to come back to this one in a moment. The investments are chosen by someone else, which is the fund manager or the investment firm, whoever's in charge of the 529. So you don't control the selection of the investments. Um, but you can look at the performance of these funds when you're choosing a 529 plan. And you can look at the Morningstar review of the 529 plan performances, and the link is in the show notes. There are the usual risks of investing in the stock market, which include past performance is no guarantee of future results or performance, and there could always be a drop in the market when you need to take out your money, and you wouldn't have time to recoup the loss. That's why targeted age-based funds uh, exist, and they do increase that bond ratio and decrease your stocks as you get closer needing, to needing your money to help somewhat mitigate the risk. And then there's the problem of leftover money. If this is your problem, it's a good problem to have, but it also means that you didn't plan too well and you kind of oversaved when, you know, eh. But I guess it's a good problem to have, right? So what can you do with the leftover money? Um, options include... Maybe your kid wants to go to grad school or med school or just keep going to school since they have the money. You could give the money to another kid that you're related to. You can take it yourself and go back to school. And it's also good to know that penalties are waived if you're a beneficiary. So if your kid ends up getting a tax-free scholarship, the penalties will be waived. If your kid goes to a U.S. military academy, they will be waived. And unfortunately, if the beneficiary dies or becomes disabled, they will be waived. So let's go back to Peanut here. Hmm. Peanut decides they don't want to go to college. So the biggest risk of the 529 is you're committing to saving for education, and if you can't use the money for that purpose, you'll have to pay taxes and penalties. So what do you do with your Peanut if Peanut decides they don't want to go to college? Well, Now's the time for your inner tiger mom to come out. And this is whether you be mom or dad or anybody who's interested in this child's future. Tiger person, it's time to come out. Make that kid, you know, whoop him. Whoop him into shape. Not whoop physically, just whoop him into shape. You know, give him a pep talk. Um, or, you know, Make the kids show you a detailed business plan showing how they're going to create the next Facebook and make billions of dollars without college. If they can pull that off, fine. They can uh, pay you back for those uh, taxes and fees when they make their billions. Yeah, I get it. College is a lot of debt for hopefully a useful education. But really it's a necessary stepping stone to getting a good job or a leg up in this world. Even if you major in advanced batik techniques, it'll still put you ahead in life. If, after all your tiger momming and business plans requests, the kid still doesn't go, what happens to your money? Well, you can change the beneficiary to some other kid who actually wants a future, as long as the kid is related to you. You can keep the account for the current ingrate beneficiary in case they change their mind later, Hey, if they decide to go when they're 30, it'll give that compound interest a chance to really kick in. Or you could take the money, pay the taxes on the gains and the 10% penalty, and go on a vacation. Leave the kid at home and torture them relentlessly with mom and dad selfies in paradise. Extra credit bonus points if you can also embarrass the kid in the process. Okay, so that's 529s. At the end of the day, TLDR, you need to rule out your state's tax benefit, then pick the best 529 for you based on the rankings. Open the account, invest your cash, and set up an auto investment or, or auto deposit each month based on what you've decided to contribute. Always remember to fund your retirement before college savings. 
Um, when you open the account, they will ask you some simple questions, and then after you answer them, they'll invest the money based on your answers. And unlike with an IRA or 401k, you don't have to do the second step of investing the money that you've contributed. Once it goes in there, it gets directed to the funds that you picked when you signed up. Now let's talk about two accounts that offer basically the opposite of all the advantages of a 529. UGMA and UTMA are just names for custodial accounts that are held in the name of a kid but controlled by a parent or relative until the age of majority. UGMA stands for Uniform Gifts to Minors Act and UTMA stands for Uniform Transfer to Minors Act. So again, we see the creative trend of naming accounts after the laws that created them. So these are custodial accounts that are held in the name of a kid and controlled by the parent or relative until the age of majority. That means the kid gets control of the account when they are anywhere from 18 to 25 years old, depending on the law in that state. You can invest gift money as well as in earned income, meaning money that the child earned. UGMAs only hold stocks, and a UTMA can hold stocks and other assets like real estate. Most states have now replaced UGMAs with UTMAs. These accounts allow you to transfer financial assets to a minor without using a trust. I have to ask though, what is the benefit of this? And you'll see what I mean in a moment. Drawbacks. We're just gonna cut right to the drawbacks, bypass the benefit slide because I really don't see any. <laughs> Okay, drawbacks. So these accounts decrease financial aid packages, first off. You know how the 529 only, um, only 6%, well, it's technically 5.64% of the, of the account value is factored into your FAFSA application? Well, with one of these accounts, 20% of the total value is factored in. So these are going to definitely cut into your financial aid package. The tax benefits are ever so slight, and when I say slight, I mean minuscule to none. What you get is the first $1,100 worth of gains is tax-free. The next $1,100 of gains is taxed at the child's marginal rate, in, which is their tax bracket, just like a grown-up. This could be zero if your kid is in a lowest tax bracket, or if your kid is Ryan the Toy on Boxer on YouTube, could be a lot more. And everything after that first 20 $2,200 is uh, taxed at the parent's marginal rate, essentially, for simplicity purposes. It's the parent's rate. Uh, these contributions are irrevocable, meaning they can't be undone. Once you put the money in there, it's in there, and it's going to that kid when they turn 18 to 25. Contributions are not tax deductible. And you cannot change beneficiaries. That money has to go to that kid who whose name was, you know, who this account was originally set up for. That's it. It's going to that one kid. Contributions are capped at $15,000 a year annually for an individual or $30,000 a year for a married couple before incurring a gift tax. Now, this is a loaded statement, and I'm going to come back to this in a moment. Finally, there is a restriction on the use of the money. So before the money is given to the kid, it can only be used for things that benefit the kid, like private school tuition, sports, music lessons, things like that. Um, but it's not for things that are considered parental obligations, which include food, housing, and clothing. So my question is why? Why would you do this? Essentially, this thing functions like a trust without the benefits of a trust and at no tax advantage to you. So why would you do this? Well, you're not 100% solid that Junior's going to college, and you want to be able to spend the money however you like. Well, you know, the kid can spend the money however they like once they inherit it. Or, not inherit, but once they get access to it. Or, your child has investments that are not going to earn more than 2200 in gains, which is about $35,000 or less. But, you know, why would you have an investment account that you want to purposely invest shitty so it has no gains? That doesn't make any sense to me. So let's go back to the gift tax concept. <clears throat> this one sounds like a benefit, but really it isn't. 
So when they say, uh, oh, you can give up to 15 or 30K, uh, you know, every year before you're subject to gift tax, that implies that any gift over 15,000 for an individual or 30,000 for a married couple would be subject to more tax. And so this account is allowing you to contribute this money without being taxed, which would be a benefit. But that is not what this means. Gift tax is a tax that's paid on a gift by the giver of the gift. And U.S. tax code allows you to give up to $11.7 million over your lifetime without paying any tax on it. Usually this $11.7 million is applied to people's estates. You know, for example, you can pass on an estate worth up to $11.7 million without paying tax on it. When you contribute to a UTMA or UGMA, if you contribute more than $15,000 as an individual or $30,000 as a married couple, then you have to file a gift tax return form with the IRS. And it, all it is is a form that says you did this. And it will count towards your lifetime goal or your lifetime limit of $11.7 million. But you don't have to pay tax on it. You only pay tax on it when you give over $11.7 million. So this gift tax bit doesn't matter at all. There's nothing special about using a UTMA or UGMA that will somehow exempt your gift from tax. It's already exempt until you hit $11.7 million. Which brings me back to why? Why would you use this account? Well, in the olden days, this kind of account was super beneficial to parents because parents could shelter their capital gains growth in a kid's account, and the gains would be taxed at a lower child's rate. They would put their assets in the kid's name and pay kid tax rates on their gains. But that possibility doesn't exist anymore because the laws have changed. Now, once total gains are over the 2200 for the year, the gains are taxed at the parents' rates. So, where does this leave us? Now you've got this funky account with no tax benefits that jacks your FAFSA. It's irrevocable, non-transferable, like a trust, but without the legal and tax benefits of a trust. I just don't get it. And the kid gets full control of the money when they're 18 to 25, right at the peak of their mature decision-making capabilities. Why not just set up a trust? That way you could control exactly when they get the money, how they get the money, what it's used for, and you could get some tax benefits plus legal shelter. There's nothing a UTMA does that a trust doesn't do, and you're already getting a trust set up for your estate Right? I know you are, especially after you watched the CYA video. So you might as well set up one for your kid at the same time. Okay, custodial Roth IRAs for kids. This is just a regular old Roth IRA that you can open with any investment bank, but it's custodial since the law says it has to be in your kid's name. I mean, excuse me, it has to be in your name if the kid is under 18 to 21 years old, depending on which state you get the account in, um, or which state you live in. The account is in the kid's name, using the kid's social security number, and then they get control of it when they reach 18 to 21, depending on the state. This is a tax-advantaged account. Contributions are post-tax, and the gains are never taxed. Withdrawals are tax-free after 59 and a half years old. Can you imagine if you started saving money for retirement at birth? You'd be set. Also, the thought of starting retirement savings at birth makes me pause to wonder what kind of society we live in where that is necessary, but I digress. Back to the list here. <laughs> the kid needs to work and earn money. Only earned income can go in here. No allowance, no gifts. Uh, Preferably W-2 wages, but you can deposit babysitting money, lawn mowing money, whatever, as long as you keep some good receipts. Ideally, if you have an LLC, like your own practice or another business that you own, your child can work for you, doing age-appropriate tasks, of course, like unboxing toys on YouTube, or being a brand ambassador. Now that's one great gig if you can swing it. Even a baby can do it. So how that works is if you're an influencer in your field and your baby is in your ads, boom, they're a brand ambassador. The max contribution is $6,000 per year and anyone can contribute. 
So you can only contribute as much as the kid earned that year though. For example, if she earned $3,000 mowing lawns, then you could only contribute $3,000 total that year, but the IRS don't care who puts the money in there. Mom, dad, relatives, friends, anyone can contribute the 3 k Although this is a retirement account, you can use it for other things without early withdrawal penalties, and those include college and a home. Kids can have traditional IRAs as well, but since most kids, you know, with the exception of Ryan, the YouTube unboxer, have pretty low incomes, a Roth is the best one to get. Here's how you use a Roth for college. Roths allow for penalty-free withdrawals if the account is at least five years old for, like I said, college and buying a house. So with college, you, if you withdraw it for college, you have to pay tax on the gains, but you don't incur any penalties. And if you withdraw the principal, there's no tax on that because the principal was already taxed before it went in the account. Just FYI, if you're using it to buy a house, um, there's no tax and no penalties, and the cap is $10,000 withdrawal. So back to college. If you are taking withdrawals from an IRA, it will count on your FAFSA. Um, but if you're not taking withdrawals from it, it does not count on your FAFSA. So it only figures into your financial aid package if you're actually using withdrawals from it. So you can still use it. You just have to use it at the last two years of college because the FAFSA uses your tax returns from two years prior to calculate that year's financial aid eligibility. So what that means is, for example, um, in 2021, if you're, if you're applying for financial aid for 2021-22 tax year, I mean, sorry, school year, the tax return they use to calculate your FAFSA, your financial aid eligibility, is from 2019. So you could use your 529 for your first two years and your Roth IRA you could apply to the last two years if you wanted to do that. Let's take a look at some examples of savings. Um, we'll look at a 10-year savings plan and an 18-year savings plan if you start saving right at birth. The, both accounts are starting from $0, saving $250 per month at a rate of 7% annual return. On the left, you see after 10 years, you would have a balance of $43,000, and total interest earned would be $13,000. This green line is the balance. Principal is a linear because it's the same amount every month. And then as you can see here, your interest starts to curve a little bit, but it's still pretty flat at the 10-year mark. With an 18-year savings plan, you would end with a balance of $106,000, uh, total contributions $54,000, and total interest $51,000. And here you see the curve is, it's starting to curve up a little more dramatically. At 18 years, it's going to meet that linear curve. However, just to prove my point from earlier, if we extended this out to 30 years, just to show you, you can see that the exponential effects of compounding interest don't really kick in until about year 20. That's when you start to see this curve really pick up and now it's off to the races. Um, you can use the calculator at savingforcollege.com to play with the numbers for savings so you can determine how much you want to be saving for college. And that link is also in the show notes. So at the end of the day, your decisions are going to come down to how much do I want to give peanut for school? How much can I afford to give peanut for school? Keeping in mind that you must cover your retirement first. And the best choice to worst choice options for accounts for savings are ranked here. So 529's best because of the tax advantages, followed by the Roth IRA, followed by your own savings. I'm putting your own savings on here because you might as well just use your own money that you've saved in your brokerage account and invested on your own because I didn't even put that UTMA nonsense up here because what's the point of that? No tax advantage or whatever. 
Now, if you do this option, you might want to put it in a nice trust. That way, your kid gets the money, you get the tax uh, advantages of having a trust, you get the legal protection of having a trust, and you get to specifically say how you want that money given to your child, when they can get it, what they can do with it. If you found this video helpful, please give it a like and subscribe to the Money Med School channel. And thanks for watching.